So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Pastor Matt Corlew. Woo! I never know what to do with this thing when I have other things to do with my hands. <clears throat> well, good morning. It is so awesome to see everybody today. Um, you know, one, one of these, oh, Rob's not here, is he? He went to McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. One of these days I was going to tell him we need to switch. I just need to learn how to sing and play the keyboards. No big deal, right? <laughs> All right, so yes, we are going to take up where uh, Pastor Paul left off last week. We are going to be doing the Shield of Faith. Now, um, boy, the more I looked into this, and it, this is no surprise to me, it's just so amazing how much there is, because to be honest, faith could take up just on its own several weeks. Um, so, without further ado, uh, turning your Bibles with me to Ephesians 6. We're going to start in verse 11. I do like the sound of Bibles, though I know most people just, you know, on the... Ephesians 6, yes, yeah. Verse 11. Oh, and I apologize, I do not have an ESV Bible. Out of all of the ones I have, I don't have an ESV. I don't know why. I just, oh well. Anyway, so it'll be a little bit different, but not, I don't think it'll be um, too far out there for, for you. So verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, right, uh, righteous like, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith, and with it you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Okay, like I said, I know it's a little bit different. I apologize for that, but you get the gist. And yes, I did start the same place that we have started over and over because repetition helps you to remember. So honestly, the more you read this passage, the better off you'll be. So we are to take up, put on, suit up, the whole armor of God. Not just a piece or a part, but the whole. If you don't have the whole, you stand naked in the enemy's camp. Now, I know it sounds a little bit redundant, but there's a point. There's, there's a reason why he, he, he reiterates the whole armor of God. And it lies in the phrase, now I know that the ESV, even, even, even what I'm reading out of, it's a homan. I know that the phrase is a little bit different. Because in verse 16... It says in every situation, and I believe it also says in every situation in the, um, it's not up there anymore, it's all right. Uh, okay, in all circumstances. That's a good phrase, and it's absolutely true. But the Greek, there's two Greek words, and they got that phrase out of the two Greek words. The first one is that P, and it means firstly, most importantly, above all, okay, and the second one is pas, and that means especially. So the first thing to do especially, take up the shield of faith. Why? Why does it tell you after, you know, it says to put on, put on the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. And then Paul goes back and he says, but firstly, 
First thing, most importantly, have the shield of faith. Faith is actually mentioned in the New Testament 243 times. It's important. How important is it? Well, let's go to Hebrews. <laughs> and yes, sometimes I have a problem finding books in the Bible too, so don't feel too bad. Hebrews chapter 11. There it is. Now, verse 6. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. It's impossible to please God without faith. It can be a scary, uh, scary situation. So faith is important. How important is it? You can't please God without it. So is your faith a crutch or is it a shield? What's the difference between a crutch and a shield? Crutches are useful when they're needed. But if you don't need it, you look like a fool on a crutch. I remember my, um, my older brother uh, was in soccer when we were at uh, Wesleyan Academy and uh, messed his knee up. So the doctor put him on crutches. And then we would have, well, my and my cousin would have races on these crutches, and they were about, you know, yay too high for me and yay too short for him. So we looked like fools running around on these crutches. Why? Because we didn't need them. <clears throat> A crutch is only useful when it's needed. And I know we've all heard it. You use your faith like a crutch. Sometimes it's used as a critique. And basically what they're saying is, you only, you only have faith because it makes you feel good, or you only have faith because your parents are, are Christians. Or, or, and honestly, that's really where that goes back to, is you only, you only claim to be a Christian you know, when, when it makes you feel good. And that can be true sometimes. Sometimes I think we do fall on, on, on our faith and, and we use it like a crutch. Sometimes it does make me feel good, but that doesn't negate the fact that it's true. Um, I love to be here. Being here makes me feel good. You know, my family makes me feel good. I have good feelings about that. That does not negate the truthfulness of who they are or, or where this place is. But if your faith, you only drag out when you need it, when you're low. Nothing else works. I might as well pray. Or when something amazing happens, you know, hey, you know, this is, God must be blessing me because this is so awesome. So, you know, I'll, I'll go to church this week because I had such an awesome week. That's a crutch. And we're easy to put it away when we don't need it. Now, if you believe that somebody's faith is rooted in how happy it makes them or, or how good it makes them feel. You'd have a hard time 
convincing the 90,000 Christians who were martyred in 2016. When all of they had to do, for most of them, now I'm not all of them obviously, but most of them, all they had to do was claim Allah is God, Muhammad is his prophet. And they'd have been okay. But they didn't. There was something deeper with their faith in Jesus Christ that made them say, no, I can't do that. All of the apostles were persecuted. Most of them were martyred. If faith meant nothing, why? They turned their faith from what some would call a crutch and turned it into a shield. Now, if you measure your faith by whether or not your family was Christian or how good it makes you feel at whatever time, or um, you drag it out when it seems like the good thing, you know, at Christmas and Easter, we call them priesters. Yeah. If that's, when you, then that's, if that's when you drag it out, then yeah, it's a crutch. You bring it out when, when, it, when it feels good or when you, when you need it, that's a crutch. But just because your family or just because there, there was a good time or just because you saw something amazing, it does not negate your faith. Most people who are Christians are Christians, yeah, because their parents are. There's an introduction. I just um, was on Facebook, and uh, yeah, I know, Facebook. Uh, But there was a a thing on there, and it it, um, was basically bashing public schools, saying that, you know, uh, your kids get... Sunday school for an hour, an hour a week, and then they're indoctrinated by the public schools for, you know, however many hours a week that is. And I wrote on there, because I couldn't, I couldn't be quiet about this, and I wrote on there, I said, if your kids are only being taught in Sunday school for one hour a week, you have a bigger problem than the public school. Because it's, it's your responsibility as a parent to bring your child up. It's your, it's your responsibility as a parent to show your kids how to clothe themselves in the armor of God. <clears throat> and I will tell you, there is nothing more exciting than when your kid has that encounter when it's deep and it's true and they in in whatever way Jesus comes they have that encounter and you know and you know you know that they know and it's unshakable so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and honestly why the armor of God is so important to me. Um, I've actually preached on, on, on the armor of God more than once. I use it in different things. Um, the kids, when we were over at Grace, we taught them the armor, armor of God. And if you saw on Facebook, Joshua, when he was six, was quoting it. Um, when I was about seven years old, My older brother came to my parents and said, I accepted Jesus. And everybody's like, oh, that's so great, you know, and they're all around him and there's, you know, and they're they're, uh, congratulating him and all of this stuff. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. So the next, you know, a couple days later, I said, you know what? I accepted Jesus too. So yeah, everybody's like, oh, you know, that's so great. And then they told me, now you got to get baptized. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. So um, we met with a pastor two or three times, and I knew all the answers. When I was in Sunday school, I would always finish the, the teacher's stories. Um, you know, because most, most of the questions are answered with Jesus, God, Moses, <laughs> Noah, you know. <laughs> you, you, learn, you, learn, you learn them. Um, so 
uh, I got baptized when I was about seven years old. Um, and then, uh, boy, I don't even know when it really started. Well, I know when it started. I was colorblind, or I am colorblind. Anybody who knows that knows I'm colorblind. Madison, yeah. Um, but I couldn't color. I could color, it's just everything I colored was black or purple. My mom thought there was some kind of mental problem with me, so she had me tested. You know, it's, and uh, well, yeah, it's purple and black, there's something wrong with my kid. Uh, no, I just, I could tell the purple and black, you know, was, was easy to do. And so they tested me, and uh, the nurse came and said, that is the worst case of colorblindness I have ever seen. So, um, turns out I'm just, I'm not black and white, I'm close. So, <laughs> black and purple, yeah. No, um, it's close to, it's, it's close. It's, and yes, I can see, you know, like bright yellow and stuff. And yes, if you point out what color is this, I can usually tell because I've actually memorized colors in the 40 some odd years that I've known, you know. But, uh. Um, I ended up having to read the colors on the crayons. And because I had to read the colors on the crayons, I learned to read. And I liked to read. So I read absolutely everything I could get my hands on. Unfortunately, um, there were books in our, in, the, in our first grade, no, it was a third grade class, because I was able to go out to the third grade class and take books out of their little library that they had in the back because I was... Every, the first grade stuff was too easy. Um, I went to the third grade class, and they had these books. Um, one of them was uh, True Ghost Stories, and one was uh, Monsters, and um, the other one was, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the other one, and I read those. I probably read them each 10, 15 times. And I got really, re really, really interested at a very young age about occultic stuff. Now, um, don't misunderstand We'll get into it, but the occultic stuff is basically like a secret knowledge. Uh, ghosts and witches and werewolves and vampires. I mean, I was intrigued. <clears throat> and um, about that time, Dungeons and Dragons came out. And I ate that up. Fantasy was like a brand new world to me. Dragons and dwarves and elves and... And please don't misunderstand, okay? Where I went with this was just because me, it's not where, you know, don't, don't think that, oh, my kid, you know, he likes, he likes Lord of the Rings or he likes C.S. Lewis or he likes Harry Potter. He's going to become, he's going to become some weird Satanist kind of, no, that's, um, that's not necessarily true. But I got into it and I got into it very heavily and, um, I was at a public school and no, the problem wasn't the public school. Although I will say in the first grade, I had a nun for, an ex-nun for a teacher. And, uh, and she uh, was teaching science. And obviously science, we learn evolution. And I'm like, no. And uh, to the point where, now I didn't know this happened. My mom told me. My mom was called into the teacher at a teacher conference because I would argue with her about the, the evolution stuff. And finally, my mom says, well, is he disrupting the class? Well, no, he's asking questions. Well, is, you know, is he, is he um, being defiant or, or unruly? He's like, no. And my mom goes, so what's the problem? Um, so, yeah, I've, I've always liked Genesis, just so you know. I've always liked Genesis. Um, anyway, so... I went to school, uh, about the fifth grade, I, I, I was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons and uh, ate it up, fell in love with it, just uh, it engulfed pretty much everything I, I did. Um, ended up going to a Christian school. <laughs> At the Christian school, when I was a sophomore, a new kid came in. And we became fast friends. We were almost inseparable. His mom was a practicing, well, Wiccan now is what it would be called. So um, he uh, brought in a lot of occultic books, and I, I, would, I read them. I ate them up. And I said, this is the coolest thing I have ever seen. 
And in, in one of them was um, a way to be a werewolf. And I know that sounds really, really goofy. Um, don't, 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 don't think, I, don't think I don't know that. <laughs> but I will tell you, demon possession is an empowering, frightening thing. Demons are disembodied spirits, and they need permission to possess but you would be amazed at the kinds of permissions you give and not even knowing it. Horoscopes, tarot cards, Ouija boards, psychics, poem readers, all permission. And if you let the enemy in, he will take control. <clears throat> so, like I said, on the weekend, well, I should say on Sunday, I was the president of the youth group. <laughs> on Friday and Saturday, I was basically, it's called transcendental, transcendental meditation now. Um, when we were doing it back then, we were basically uh, leaving our bodies and going to an entirely different plane of existence. Um, and, and in that existence is, is where I really got introduced to the fantasy thing. And one of those things was armor. You had to have armor because if you were out there and there were dragons and there were different things coming against you, you had to have armor. And I thought at the time that it was okay to use those things of magic um, and, and be on God's side. I'll tell you it's not. The enemy will, while he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he will do it. Now, I was blessed. As I'm going through these things, I had a teacher at the, at the high school named Mr. Dickinson. He taught math and algebra and calculus and computer class and anything to do with that kind of stuff. The man was brilliant. And he paid attention to me. So much so that he would not let me get out of this stupid algebra class until I could pass it with no less than a C. <laughs> I had to take Algebra 1 for two years <laughs> just to get out of it. But because he, he noticed me, he began to pray for me. And I only know this because he told me later, but I know he was praying for me. The other person I know who was praying for me because she knew I was screwed up with something was my mom. I remember being in the parking lot of the church and a lady coming to her with tears in her eyes because she was going through some major, major stuff. And she said, there was basically a breakthrough. I know somebody must have been praying for me. And I knew it was my mom because I had heard my mom praying for her specifically. My mom was a prayer warrior. She was always, you know, always on her knees. She still is. <clears throat> so I know she was praying for me. So let's, let's get back. How, how did we get off on this? Well, I'll tell you. Like I said, the armor, okay? It, it meant something to me. It was fantasy. I knew it. I, I felt it. I had it on, okay? And 
like I said, demon possession is something don't mess with. But it, 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 it was empowering at the time, not... Um, because of how much friction there was in my life. Because you can't go to church on Sunday and Tuesday and Wednesday and any other time that the church doors were open because my dad would drag us there every single time. And there were times that we got dragged to church when the doors weren't open so we could mow the lawn or we could paint this or we could... We were always there, it seemed like. And you can't live that life and... and and have the enemy be happy about it. So there was a huge conflict. So much so that I, um, there are incantations and stuff like this, and it's all magic, and yes, I know, you have to understand, magic isn't something to mess with. It really isn't. There's things behind it. There were incantations I was doing, um, basically to kill myself and um, it didn't work I didn't know why I was a little bit mad um, and when I was a senior I had gotten to the point where the conflict was too much and I felt compelled to go out to the field behind our house. And I fell on my knees and I said, I know, God, you are real. I am so done with who I am. What do I do now? And in that brief moment, and it was brief, in that brief moment, I stood there and I saw colors I had never seen before in my entire life and I could feel the Holy Spirit saying I can open your way your eyes in ways you had never thought they could be open and I said and I know who you are and that's what I want and at that moment that was my reckoning that's when I came to Jesus Christ that's when I knew beyond an unshakable doubt that there was there was a God And that's one of the reasons that I can stand here today. So why is the, the armor of God important? Because I knew that there was armor. I knew what it means to have a shield and a breastplate and a sword against the enemy. So let's go back to Ephesians and see how faith is so important. Ephesians 2. 8 and 9. I'm just going to read this. Okay. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. Your faith saves you. And it's a gift. And 11.6 tells you, you can't please God without faith. So what does God do? He brings you along into it. And then the most amazing thing happens, and this one, you got to see this. 2 Corinthians 5.21. And this one, I'm, I'm going to read it. It's just, this, honestly, this verse um, could be its, its own sermon. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why is faith so important? 
Because when we have that encounter, when we, when we become one of the children of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who took all of our sins and stuck it on the cross in his own body, and it pleased the Father to crush him so that those sins were punished, that his shed blood was poured out to take sin away. All of them. And don't think if you sin tomorrow, it wasn't covered at the cross because every sin was future for Jesus at the cross. So even your future sins were always future for him and they're all covered. They're all taken away. And then the most amazing thing happens. He takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. Not just righteousness, his righteousness righteousness. So if we put on his righteousness, there's your breastplate. How did you get it? Through faith in Jesus Christ. When we have Jesus, we have all that he is. We don't become him, but everything that he is becomes available to us. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If Jesus is the truth, there's your belt. So, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have his righteousness. And through that, you have the belt of truth. Ephesians 2.14. He is our peace. Who is it that has given us apostles and teachers and evangelists to equip, that is, prepare us to spread the gospel? Jesus Christ. He is our peace of the gospel on our feet. How do we get that? Through faith in who he is. Why does it say it's so important? Why does it say above everything else, make sure that you have the shield of faith? Because the shield of faith covers and encompasses everything else there is. Obviously, in the next couple of weeks, um, we're going to see how the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit also are brought out by faith. You got my back on that, right? <laughs> yeah. So if anybody ever tells you, your faith is a crutch, look at him and say, no, it's my shield. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for clothing us in, in who you are that each piece of that armor you give to us to put on and put on that whole armor so we can stand and stand firm. Father, there's so much in this. Um, open our eyes, help us to see, and give us um, that sometimes kick that we need to go out into the world. Because you've given us the armor, you've clothed us, you, you protect us, you are our shield, you are our strong tower. Help us to be able to go out into the world and not stop until the whole world knows. The amazingness of who you are, how your mercy and your grace are renewed daily. We love you, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Help us to go from this place and not forget what we've learned that our faith is our shield, and yeah, sometimes we have to hide behind it. But that's the whole point. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.